I will introduce a subject to you this morning that I by no means will exhaust. Brother Evans wrote me a lovely letter the other day on a subject that stirred my mind up considerably. And I thought I would introduce some of the thoughts he did to us today for our consideration. And if it's the Lord's will, we may be wiser in spiritual things than we were. The subject is baptism. We mention baptism a lot, but we rarely get into all of the details of it. Evans, I hope you don't mind. The first question is why someone needs to be baptized to join a particular church. That's a good question. There's only one thing in there I would comment on in a manner of negative approach. That is join the church. We all use that term. But I don't believe that in the final analysis anybody joins the church. The Lord adds to the church. We, as I say, we all use that expression. <coughs> Do they need to be baptized to be united with the church? This would depend a lot upon what your interpretation of the church is. Do you view the church as the local assembly only? Or as the general assembly of all of the redeemed of all time? I'll not ask anybody to give their views on that because I'm sure we'd get a variety. I think I'll just start in this subject at the starting place. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered it. Jesus comes to John. John has been given no commission to organize any churches, has he? John the Baptist was sent by God to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now it says here that all Judea and the regions round about Jerusalem came to him at Jordan and were baptized of him, confessing their sins. This seems in order. But this being the first instance in the New Testament of baptism, we have to wonder what did they know about baptism that we would learn later that there was a need of confessing sins in association with baptism. And I think today probably tradition has led us to believe that if someone wants to unite with this or another church, that they must come to the front, turn around, and say to the congregation, I'm the worst sinner on earth. And I want to be baptized and join this church. And there's very few churches that turn them down. Am I right or am I wrong? Where did we get that tradition? 
Do we find something similar to that in the New Testament? Here in the outset of baptism, Jesus comes to John. Others have been baptized before Jesus. They confess their sins. Jesus comes, having no sins to confess, but confessing that it becometh them to fulfill all righteousness. Not him and John, but the Godhead. John is here only to baptize. The Godhead fulfills all righteousness when Jesus comes up out of the water and God sends His Spirit down upon Him in a visible fashion in the form of a dove and said, This is my beloved Son. This is the beginning of baptism. Whatever they call baptisms in the Old Testament have no bearing whatsoever upon this. This is based upon a completely new economy. The new covenant identified in, around, and through Jesus, the sinless sin bearer. And his first act of public ministry is traveling down yonder to Jordan where where, uh, John is baptizing and says, I have need to be baptized of thee. John couldn't understand this. And you couldn't either if it was in, he was in his shoes. John is the lesser. He's the one who said, he must increase and I must decrease. But this was the will of the Father that Jesus, the head of the church, the founder and the builder and the chief cornerstone of the church which Jesus would build would be baptized by a man called John the Baptist. Don't get excited about me trying to make a great swelling oratorical uh, confession in favor of the name Baptist. That's not high on the agenda. I want to emphasize that Jesus was baptized as the head, as the cornerstone of the foundation of the church which he would himself build and add unto daily. Let's go now to the end of the book of Matthew. There's no continuity in what I'm trying to deliver to you this morning. Just some brief beginning expressions. Jesus was raised from the tomb on the third day, early in the morning. The eleven disciples went away to Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. The reformers would have a fit over that, wouldn't they? Doubting disciples. Can you imagine such a thing? Disciples that doubt. Well, it said they did. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore. Well, stop right here. I, I, I've, I've just got to go up a bypass. We're not going to get very far in baptism. I see that right now. Do you read anything in that? Can you see anything in that at all that would lead you to believe that somebody could classify this and make it stick as the Great Commission? Where is this called the Great Commission? Who said it was? And if it is a commission of any sort, and I believe it is, it's a commission to those he spoke to, was it the church or the disciples? To whom he spoke. Think on that. Did he give this instruction to go into all the world unto a religious organization or unto the disciples that he called unto him in the mountain in Galilee? 
I'll let you decipher that and I'll go on. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. A lot of people believe that word G-O is spelled S-E-N-D. Don't they? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Early in on this, he tells them to teach them, but not until he tells them to baptize them. I would ask you this before we go on from this text. Do you believe that in the last message that Jesus provided for the disciples here, that he believed that the subject of baptism was of some vital importance to the disciples, to be taught wherever they went in all the world? Certainly it was. Well, I'm going to skip some verses. I would like you to turn with me to the book of Acts. Second chapter. This is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit come down like cloven tongues of fire and wind upon all of those that were gathered there. Peter rose up and spoke as man had probably never heard before. After he had concluded his discourse with this, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. It had an effect on them. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now you will notice the little tincture there of Armenianism in their question. It is the ordinary way for people to want to know, What do I do? If you get in trouble... You say, what can I do to make this right? Human nature. But we're not dealing in the human, we're dealing in the divine now. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, listen carefully, repent and be baptized. Do you see how he associates those two entities together? Repent and be baptized. Now in the last chapter of Mark, chapter 16, I believe it's about verse 13. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We do not believe that there is any saving power in the water or in the believing but to demonstrate that only a believer may be baptized. Now, a believer may not be baptized unless he is a repentant believer, unless God has stirred him and granted him the spirit of repentance to confess or be willing to confess his sins and turn from the world unto the scenes of glory in the kingdom of God's dear Son, where they might worship him though frailly. Repent and be baptized. I don't think the message of baptism is worth a hoot unless it's repent and be baptized. Someone says, Brother Poole, I'd like to come before Wells Track Church and be baptized. You know what I believe I'd have to say? Are you coming to repent and be baptized or just coming to be baptized? And if you haven't come 
with the power of repentance filling your soul, you don't need baptism yet. Now there comes a question, a couple more good questions here, but there comes this question in my mind, when should a person be baptized? Do you recall the story of Philip and the eunuch? The Lord himself sent Philip down yonder in the desert to meet with the eunuch. The eunuch's busy reading Isaiah 53. Commendable. Philip joins with him in his chariot and begins to preach unto him the Spurgeon's Catechism, Luther's Catechism, Confession of 1689, the Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, all these other things. Wouldn't that be nice? That's the way they do it today. Look about you. Take your religious organizations go to them one by one. Walk in there unbeknownst to them who you are and say, I'd like to join your church. Join. That's the only thing they'd understand. I, if you said, I'd like to be added, they'd say, what do you mean? I'd like to join your church. Well, we have this pattern in the church that the pastor must come to your home and call upon you six or eight times in the next six months in order to see whether or not you've got qualifications. And we've got to catechize you. And uh, what they're really saying is we're going to brainwash you into what we believe and see if you might be a good little puppy dog in our pen. Or words to that effect. Somebody comes before the church of the living God and wants to be baptized. We must know several things. One is, do they have the walk? Do they bear witness that God has granted them repentance unto life? That don't mean we have to observe them for years. But I think it would be a foolhardy thing for us to take some individual who walked in freshly today from off the road and said, I want to join your church. You don't know us, friend. We don't know you. Let's learn something about one another. But suppose it was one of you who had been here for some time and you wanted to unite with the church. Do you have to go through a long spiel? Do you have to relate it some formula before us? Do you even have to come to the front? Suppose you're sitting over there in the corner and the gospel message is coming to you in power and force and the glories of Jesus Christ are being manifest. And you feel in your heart a love for Him. And you know enough about what's going on that you know those that love Him and believe upon Him want to be baptized and you feel that you have been blessed with the spirit of repentance. You don't have to come forward. You can start hollering back there, Elder Fool, I need to go to the water. I don't believe anybody here object. Do you? But, let's suppose everybody in here did object. Except me. If I was satisfied with him, I'd baptize him, no matter what you say. Yes, I would. Now, if you don't want to receive him in the church after he's manifest whatever the Lord has given him, that's the church's business. But the authority to baptize and discern whether or not to baptize is the gift given to the ministry. And when the church so-called ordains a man, I'm going to have to jump off in some hot water here right now. What is ordinations? You show me in the book of Acts or any of the epistles of Paul, James, Peter, John, or anyone else, where anyone ever had an ordination service to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not there. You say, but it's implied. I don't find it implied. I do find where Paul 
told Titus, I believe it was, to ordain elders in every church. And any fool can go to Strong's Concordance, Young's Concordance, Cruden's Concordance, or any good lexicon and discover there that ordain means to point out. Doesn't mean to get the fellow up front and then call his wife and then call a presbytery and go through all of this ritual and read all of these things to him and make him bow down and go through incantations and everything, then vote on him and do all of that business and then give him a charge and lay hands all over him and bless him two or three times like the Pope and the Catholics and all would do. It's sickening and it's sorry. We've all done it, but it doesn't make it right or in accordance with the Bible. If it's in accordance with the Bible, I will ask you to give it to me and I will apologize next second Sunday. Okay? Is that fair enough? I'm not saying that it's so bad in itself. It's nothing but a tradition. If you want to do that as a tradition, I'm not going to bellyate. But if you think that is the sacred word on the matter, you're wrong. About 90% of what we do is nothing more than tradition. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the central theme of every doctrine we've got. It's the central theme of every practice we've got. It's the glorious theme of everything the child of God needs to know. And in baptism, when someone has a burden to be baptized, they are having a burden to fulfill the very first act of service and obedience to their God. I can say this safely, that until one's been baptized, they're not walking in the gospel way. They simply are not. I wish the scriptures produced some evidence of baptism as a requirement to join the local assembly. That's a yes and a no. There is no scripture that requires anyone to be baptized in order to join an assembly. But the assembly, I believe, is under good decorum to receive no one into the assembly until they have been baptized. And this is the reason. No one in all of the scriptures you cannot find an instance where they were ever, ever given a heart to desire baptism, delayed or tarried on the matter. 